in, a, in the brand new Department of Quantitative Health Sciences at UMass Worcester. Um, neither of these affiliations would give you any reason to think that I would be giving a talk here today about electoral integrity. Um, but uh, I have a, a varied, some might say checkered career of uh, being interested in solving problems and coming from a family where all the siblings have PhDs in mathematics. Uh, uh, I've, I've been involved in a lot of really different stuff. And, and some years ago, I was um, uh, involved as an expert witness in, in uh, winning upgrades in pay for the women teachers of the uh, state colleges of Massachusetts. And so I had experience being on the stand and being quizzed and uh, learning what to do when somebody uh, waves their hand in your face and says, and is the, isn't that so, Dr. Ash? <laughs> so in 2000, uh, I had the experience of going to Florida in December of 2000 um, to participate in one of the absentee ballot fraud trials in Florida. That was very exciting and very energizing. And since that time, a sideline that I do outside of my medical school career is uh, working on electoral integrity issues. Uh, I've been very active with the American Statistical Association, which has, uh, I'm very, very happy and proud to say, has truly uh, thrown its weight behind this serious problem in our country, that we don't take our elections seriously, and um, the entire electoral process is, is fairly well a mess. And, um, and we're trying to do something about it. Actually, next weekend I'll be in Washington at a meeting convened by the American Statistical Association of Electoral Integrity activists and, uh, and technical folks and clerical folks, people who run elections, to really try to figure out what we can do to help the states um, develop better auditing procedures. So this is a little sideline that I've been very involved in since 2000. And uh, you'll find that my slides are very simple, um, that almost every word on them is uh, a very common English word. <laughs> uh, but uh, the story that I'm, t I'm going to tell you is, uh, is, I think, really pretty interesting nonetheless, despite its simplicity. Um, also, if you were expecting um, the title uh, to make you think that there'd be some very fancy statistics talked about, uh, the statistics that are most useful in, um, for many, many purposes in thinking about electoral integrity uh, are really very simple statistics. Uh, for those who do want to uh, use fancy math, there are problems that need solving that require fancy math, but a lot of the problems really require some very basic stuff. So this slide, um, this slide uh, is I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, it basically just says what the title says, U.S. elections really are a mess. Uh, it is astounding that in a country which uh, has prided itself on, uh, you know, industrial quality control and, and, um, and really getting, getting technology right, that something which the vast majority of nations in the world do very well, thank you, run elections uh, that, are, that, are, that are pretty well regulated. Um, and uh, I think until 2000, we kind of thought that we did too. And we knew that there were occasional problems, but we didn't really um, confront the fact that there were very large, common, systemic problems that occur again and again and again in every election. And uh, so when we saw these problems in 2000, uh, we hurried up and passed HAVA, the Help America Vote Act, and decided that we would get rid of those, uh, those uh, punch lever machines and really solve these problems with, with some you know, modern day technology instead of those, that 19th century technology that we'd been using. Uh, and really we got ahead of ourselves. We got ahead of ourselves in the sense that the timelines for instituting two t new technology to solve the electoral problems were too rapid for the community to really figure out 
what the protocols and what the specs should be. So a lot of states bought equipment, which actually made things not better. So what is the problem with American elections? One thing is that we're practically unique in the world in the complexity of our elections. So in many parts of the world, you want to elect a president. You uh, have a ballot, which basically says, which one of these people do you want to be president? <laughs> and there's one piece of paper, and there's one election, and you're done with it. Uh, in the United States, we jam up on one electoral ballot, typically 40, 50, even 90 different issues, races, questions, ch choices. Furthermore, the issues that confront one voter um, may be quite different. They have overlap, but quite, quite different from those that confront another voter who happens to be in a different sewer district, in a slightly different neighborhood, uh, a, the, with the, the boundaries across which the ballot has to change are very, very, m very many boundaries. So um, we can't just sort of publish in the paper, this is what your ballot is going to look like, because your ballot is going to look different if you're over here or if you're actually just a few miles away across some, some relevant boundary that means you're voting on a different issue or a different race or have different candidates. So we have really created a situation in which it is very difficult to exercise quality control. Another thing that we've done, and this is uh, a holdover from um, moving from there being a bunch of colonies to being a perhaps United States of America, <laughs> that uh, in the Constitution we have, we have written in uh, effectively local control of elections. So in fact, it is, not, it is not legally possible for the federal government to step in and say, this is the way to do it. Everybody's going to do it this way. And not only do the states have their, each state has a different way of doing things, but actually relatively local, usually county election officials are in charge of what happens for themselves. Another thing that makes elections difficult is that they're sporadic. So it's not like um, people running, um, setting up ATM machines in which there's, they're used every day, and if there's a problem, it's noticed, and it's fixed, and it's worked on. So it's probably not too smart to have gone to laptop technology for a, uh, a problem that arises once every two years. By the time you've used the laptop about three or four times, it is really obsolete, and it's impossible to get machinery, it's impossible to get the parts to fix anything that goes wrong. So really there was not adequate thought about what would be required to try to make elections uh, more sensible um, and, and more reliable. Okay, so um, the problem is when you have a really, really messy situation and you have a lot of people who are sitting there with these laptop machines that have been slapped together to be your voting machines, um, and they don't have special training in designing the ballot, um, well, those ballots, some of them look pretty good, and some of them have mistakes. And I think in 2000, the, there were a bunch of new words that came into our vocabulary. The butterfly ballot was one of them. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of election that occurred in 2006 where the m it's fairly clear that poor ballot design uh, really flipped the outcome of the election. So um, there, there seems to be a cottage industry associated with the losers of especially close elections um, trying to uh, go through the courts and, and string things out uh, as long as possible and say, I was cheated, you know, we have to check it. We, we get told that um, maybe the election stands, but then it's appealed, and then it's appealed, and then it's appealed. Um, it's very difficult, and I actually have a great deal of sympathy with the courts in being extremely reluctant to overturn an election. 
Uh, it's, it's something we really want to try to be able to figure out the difference between a close election in which somebody had a win and somebody did win, and that's fine, that's the winner, and uh, a close election or a not close election in which the putative winner apparently did not win. And so I want to give you an example, talk you through it, and then talk about some of the issues. I will say that a pet peeve of mine is that although there are many people, many people in the press who write wonderful articles about the potential for problems prior to elections, there is almost nobody who writes about um, credible reasons to doubt the outcome of elections in the US after they've happened. So I was extremely angry in 2004 when there were many, many anomalies in the national elections and the people who pointed to them were described as crazies. What I would say as a person who spent a long time studying the 2004 election for president is that I don't believe that anybody honest can tell you who really should have won. I really do not believe that we know. And that's because there is a sense in this country that we need closure, that we need a definitive answer, that we have to close ranks and, and shut up those crazies who suggest that maybe we don't know what the answer is. And um, I would urge you not to be in that, not to be in that mode. So I'm going to talk today about one, give you one example of a failed election. And I want to tell you first what I mean by a failed election. That's what mathematicians do. They define things and then they talk about them. So um, in simple terms, I'm talking about an election where the winner, the declared winner, didn't really win. And uh, what I mean by that is that uh, if you were able to discern the choices and desires of all the legitimate voters who went to the effort of going to the polls and, and uh, casting their votes, um, that the person who was declared the winner was not the person who most of the voters wanted. So that's what I mean by a failed election. I, I want to make a distinction here about what I'm not talking about. And um, we have in this country a situation in which there's an entirely legally sanctioned sense in which you could have an election in which the majority of the people want A, but B is elected without there being any irregularity. For example, the presidential election. And uh, many people think that that probably is a problem that ought to be fixed. I am not going to comment on whether it's a problem to be fixed or not. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a simple situation in which we have one race, uh, one set of voters, and, uh, and a problem with who is declared the winner. Uh, the other, another very, very interesting problem in uh, elections and electoral fairness is the problem of gerrymandering. And uh, it is now possible to, um, to to use very sophisticated computer programs to make sure that all the congressional districts in a state meet the one criterion which everybody agrees fairness requires, which is that each one has essentially the same number of voters, so that you don't have, in one case, 100,000 people electing a congressman, and in another case, 500,000 people electing one congressman. We, ha we can solve that problem. The uh, computers we have, the data we have, makes it easy to solve that problem. But, but gerrymandering is alive and well. And one reason we can't fix the problem of gerrymandering is that nobody's come up with a definition of what it means to have a, a good, <laughs> to, to have a defensible uh, definition of what it means to do a good job of chopping up your, your state into districts. Uh, and there's some very interesting papers that have been written about this. I'm going to point you to some websites uh, at the end of my talk. Uh, so if you're interested in that question, um, mathematicians and statisticians have thought about that as well. 
but that's not what I'm talking about today. So what I am talking about today is a particular race in the state of Florida. Florida is so famous and so good to us in giving us rich examples. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a congressional, it's a congressional race in uh, Congressional District 13, CD 13. And uh, it occurred in the year 2006. And um, the Republican, Buchanan, uh, was declared the winner by 369 votes out of about 240,000 votes. And that's about the number of votes you would have in any congressional district. Uh, you might have more in one where more of the eligible voters vote but basically about a quarter of a million people is what it takes to elect one congressperson. Uh, and the mar margin of victory was actually uh, like quite a bit less than one quarter of one percent. And uh, most people would say, whoa, that's a really close election. We better recount all those ballots. We better check. I mean, that's just a very, very small margin. And one of the things I'm going to talk to you about is how small a margin is that and, um, and uh, Maybe, maybe tell you something you don't know about numbers like, like that. Um, so something you should know about CD13 is that it's, um, it's one of those districts that was put together um, by putting two very different kinds of counties into the same district. And so there's a Democratic-leaning part to the county to the CD, to the Congressional District, and there's a Republican-leaning part. And um, Sarasota County was the Democratic-leaning part, and there were a lot of undervotes. So undervote might be the one word in my talk that is not really common knowledge, and uh, so I'll take a moment to tell you what it is. So uh, a voter goes to the polls, gets a ballot, casts the ballot, and on a particular race, there is no recorded vote. That is called an undervote in that race. This is no big deal. It happens all the time, especially if you have 47 different races that you've been asked to make decisions on. Many people consciously undervote. Here is a race for dog catcher. They have no opinion. They do not vote for anyone for dog catcher. That's an undervote in the race for dog catcher. I will tell you that the race for the congressional district in CD13 in 2006 was not a, uh, an unimportant, uh, uh, unpublicized race. It was an open seat. It had previously been the uh, congressional seat that was occupied by Katherine Harris, who went on to run for senator in that year and did not win. Um, and so it was one of those rare instances of an open seat. It was very hotly contested. Uh, so it's extremely surprising to find 15% of the people who cast votes in other races not casting a vote, undervoting in this particular race. And in fact, in the rest of the district, the Republican-leaning counties, pieces, counties and pieces of counties that were affixed to this, uh, this to Sarasota County, uh, there were normal votes of un uh, normal rates of undervoting, which are in the neighborhood of two to three percent. So it turned out that there were at least 15,000 excess undervotes in this race in Sarasota County. And th there's a couple of questions. One of them is, why? And another one is, what would have been the outcome of the race had those 15,000 votes been recorded? If, in fact, those 15,000 extra undervotes re reflected people who just didn't feel like voting, then you got the perfect answer with um, what was actually counted. But if somehow there was a reason other than voter choice for those undervotes, then there's a job for statisticians to think about what might have happened if those 15,000 votes had been counted. So I think you've all got the setup now. Um, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't resist. <laughs> I will tell you something. Florida did get something really right. They have sunshine laws, and they were able to provide us with the data, which 
which enables this talk and which enables us to really understand what the problems were. So uh, there's, anyway, th we move on. <laughs> so do 15,000 lost votes matter in this situation? And I think there's a natural intuition that you all have that says, of course, 15,000 lost votes is an enormous number of lost votes. And 369 is a very tiny margin. And if we think of it in terms of percentages, most, reca most mandated recounts cut in at the 1% or the half percent, and we are here down below actually the two-tenths of 1% level of, of margin of victory. So, um, so the natural thought is, of course they matter. Well, if they were distributed at random, if you just happened to drop one here and drop one there with no pattern, it would not have changed the outcome one bit. And that's the magic of statistics. So this is something that if you uh, have stat one, one course, uh, you will be able to learn enough statistics to, to follow um, or even to develop an argument like the one I'm going to show you. Uh, you probably remember that it's easy for things to be off by one or two standard errors um, just by chance alone. But by the time you get to three standard errors off or four or five or six, these things don't happen. These are so rare as to essentially be not credible. And um, if you use the squ square root law and you compute the standard error associated with um, 15,000 votes that could go either way to uh, either the Republican Buchanan or the Democrat uh, Jennings, um, you will find that basically, if I just happen to lose every few votes at random and I lost 15,000 of them, it wouldn't change the outcome by more than 60 or 120 or maybe 180, but it certainly wouldn't flip the outcome by as much as 369. So this would be a rock solid finding if 15,000 votes had just been lost at random. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of zeros there. It's one in multiple, <laughs> I, should, I should have figured that out, but it is really, it's zero. For all practical purposes, it's zero. Yes? Yes, so that's a wonderful comment. This is essentially, a, a if in fact these were lost at random, then they would be apportioned in the same ratio that they were apportioned among the votes that were not lost. And if they were, you could have a little bit of fluctuation. So if I lost 10 votes, they wouldn't come out 5 and 5. They might come out 6 and 4. The kind of variation that you measure with these standard errors is that kind of difference. So if I lost 100 votes, they wouldn't come out 50-50. They might come out 45-55. If I lost 15,000 votes, they wouldn't come out half and half, but they wouldn't differ from half and half by very much more than 60 or 100 votes. So that's the underlying mathematical model. That's a fancy name for saying we would assume that the lost votes, if lost, at, if lost at random, would be just like the ones that we had seen. So they wouldn't change anything. Yes, I did say that most of these were in the Democratic-leaning part. So in fact, notice that big word, if. If they had been lost at random, then you could say that this wouldn't change a thing in terms of the outcome. But I would contend that it is a, an example of vote theft. So I'm not the person who invented this word, but I, I, this phrase, I love it, I think it's important, and I want you to start using it. <laughs> and <laughs> so let me tell you uh, what I mean by vote theft.
there's such a, a lot, people throw around a lot of words here, and they talk about vote fraud. And vote fraud is actually used in, uh, to have two very different principal meanings. Um, so one of them is voter fraud, and what we imagine here is someone who doesn't have the right to vote, who goes in and does vote, or someone who does or doesn't have the right to vote and votes multiple times, and some individual who is, uh, who is abusing the right to vote. Okay, um, but there's something else that I've called vote theft, and it's disenfranchisement. It's where the way the system is run has taken a person who has the right to expect that their vote will be counted and their vote was not counted. So I think it's a little bit like the language that's used to talk about welfare fraud. There's welfare queen kind of fraud where somebody who doesn't deserve welfare uh, is getting it. But there's another kind of welfare fraud which is welfare theft. When a state in trying to save money makes it very hard for a person who was legitimately entitled to get a welfare benefit and make sure that they don't get it or that it's very hard or, they get, or that, that it gets put off. So I think that there's really an, an, an analogy here that's worth thinking about. And one thing that caused me to think carefully about this language was uh, some years ago I was involved in an electoral integrity conference and there were a lot of talks about how screwy elections are and how Many people get disenfranchised from legitimate votes. And, and somebody wrote it up saying there was a, an election, there was a meeting this weekend and people were talking about voter fraud. No, 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 we were not talking about voter fraud. <laughs> okay, got it? That's the difference. So what happened in the year 2006 in Florida in CD13? Um, bad ballot design. So in fact, the missing 15,000 extra 15,000 were in Sarasota County and not the other counties. And why was that so? Because Sarasota County's ballot was designed by a Sarasota County election clerk, and the other ballots were designed by, by clerks in the other counties that made up the district. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, the district. So you can see that... Uh, Sarasota County is over here on the coast of Florida, and then you've got pieces of these interior counties, Manatee, um, DeSoto, and Mardi, Mardi County, and it was constructed in such a way that there's about half the votes in each of the, in each of the two parts of the congressional district. Okay, now here's the ballot. So I want you to pay attention. Let's look at this ballot. Uh, it's a little muddy here, but official general election ballot, Sarasota County, Florida, November 7, 2006. Big blue banner, congressional, okay? United States Senator, vote for one. See Catherine Harris at the top? Okay, and then there's a very, uh, you know, wide range of others who are running and right in at the bottom. That's your first page out of... 21 pages of ballot that you will have to go through before you're at the end, and there will be an opportunity to review all your votes, and if you have any problem with how it was cast, you can go back. Okay, here's the second page. What do you see? What do you see? This is... <laughs> so, there... <laughs> Everybody's eye jumps to the banner that's colored that says state. And there's a, um, there's a, a race for governor and lieutenant governor that takes up a lot of lines on the page. And what you don't see, what I bet some of you haven't even seen yet, is the two lines at the top of the page. The two lines at the top of the page uh, say Vern Buchanan and Christine Jennings for the U.S. Representative in Congress. So is it surprising that a lot of people miss this? Okay. Uh, it looks like a continuation from the last page. It is certainly in retrospect obvious that this is not a desirable ballot design. Um, was there any malice associated with this? I don't know. I mean, incompetence is actually a very, uh, <laughs> a, ver 
that, that's actually a cruel word, but, but anyway, just a mistake <laughs> is, is, a, is a very good possible explanation for what we're looking at. But uh, in any case, that's what the ballot looked like. And certainly in retrospect, everybody looking at that says, oh my God, of course, of course that's, that would cause many people who had intended to vote for that race to not vote. Yes? Uh, and there's no write-in for that one. I, I don't uh, actually know why there's no write-in for that one. But anyway, there it is, and that's the ballot. So that's, that's uh, at least part of what was going on. Am I suggesting that if they'd highlighted the race at the top, it would have obviated the problem? Uh, it certainly would have made it uh, better, but uh, you know, there are people who actually have a discipline which study how you should put things up on the page so that people get it right. And uh, I think they would tell you that you should probably give a separate page for each of these really important federal elections. Go back one page. Page one, page two. Okay, so um, if furthermore, there's a lot of a lot of um, uh, contemporary, independent evidence. This particular ballot design that you're looking at on page two is bad. There were other races in Florida uh, that happened to get wedged next to the governor's race, which uses a lot of lines, and in some of the counties. Uh, the races that were next to the governor's race on the same page had 22% missing undervotes. But that didn't get a lot of press because they were in races that weren't close. Okay. But in any case, I think, you, I think you got it. We can move on. Okay, so what did happen and what didn't happen? So is it, does it mean anything that the, that the um, election supervisor who designed the ballot was a Republican. I, I don't know whether it did or it didn't in terms of the intentions going into the elections. I do know that, that she was pretty defensive and unwilling to uh, admit that maybe she had contributed to what happened. And uh, she, um, she kept getting press, again, press. <laughs> she kept getting press for, for uh, at more than a year after the election, uh, being quoted as saying, this was such a nasty election that voters got disgusted and they just boycotted this. You know, this was just such a nasty campaign. That must be why 15% of the people in this county didn't vote. Certainly didn't have anything to do with my design of the ballot. And I don't mind her saying that, but I mind the press repeating it as if it has any credence. And uh, it do certainly doesn't have any credence because the campaign was equally nasty in the other parts of the same district and did not result in more than two to three percent. So, so, so really it's an explanation that goes counter to the evidence. And I, I really dislike the idea that people think that, to be fair, you have to air comments on all sides of an issue even when some of them are ridiculous. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. Right. Um, so there were other issues, uh, and, um, and the courts uh, considered this. Uh, Jennings had, a, had a, uh, an appeal, and uh, ultimately uh, the courts basically say there's two conditions on which we can uh, overturn an election. And one is if someone can uh, prove fraud. You know, was there fraudulent intent here? And the other one is if the machinery itself really ate the votes. If you prove that what happened is these voters did vote, but the vote didn't get tabulated. That would be something that we could correct. But since I everyone agrees, everyone except Kathy Dent agrees, that uh, what happened was bad ballot design and that, that was the principal cause of the problems, then that's voter error. And voter error isn't anything we can fix. It's the voter's job to cast the ballot correctly. If the voter doesn't cast the ballot correctly, it's the voter's problem, it's not the public's problem. Okay, so that's what happened. 
uh, did these 15,000 votes in this race matter? And um, as we said, the, uh, the undervote wasn't random. It occurred in Sarasota County. If you view the missing votes as if they were like the votes of anybody else in Sarasota County, in Sarasota County, for every 1,000 votes cast, there was a 50-vote advantage for the Democrat. So if you lost 15,000 votes, then the Democrat would have picked up 50 times 15, 750 votes. If she had picked up 750 votes, she would have had a win that was approximately as large as she had a loss. So with that very simple model of the undervote, you have a flipped election. Now, um, when people start pouring over an election, um, they actually find a lot of things that were not entirely the way you'd want them to be. And um, so this is a much studied election because we have this wonderful data from, <laughs> from Florida. And, um, and, we've, and all kinds of things were discovered in the lawsuit and uh, it is the case that there, there were some glitches with the machinery. And even on the day of election, um, the wife of the winning candidate complained that it was very hard for her to use the machinery to cast the vote for her husband. And, um, and she was really worried that the, the election was going to be stolen on that basis. <laughs> uh, but after the election, she was not, con she was not persisting in that argument. Uh, so anyway, um, so uh, there were lots of things. There was a paper trail of warnings from the manufacturer that there were some issues, that the machine response time was slow. So if there's a toggle, you hit something and you're waiting for it to take and it doesn't take so you hit it again so you undo it. Um, there's some relatively arcane and subtle things which people who have poured all over this have found and there certainly were other issues. Uh, but but one thing I would say is the other issues tended to apply across the entire district, and the only thing that was really dramatically different uh, between Sarasota County and the rest of the district was the bad, bad ballot design. Um, there was uh, a review screen at the end, so we, uh, it is reasonable to assume, although impossible to actually check in retrospect, that these voters who failed to cast a vote in that race did have the opportunity, if they were paying attention to the review screen, to see that they hadn't voted. But there wasn't a bold warning saying, hey, this is an important race. You didn't vote in it. Is that what you wanted? There's real questions about how much you can use that, because once you've got 47 races that you're running on, how, how many times are people going to want to be told, did you really not want to vote or did you really want not want to vote there? But maybe for federal races, they really should be reminded. Okay, so, um, so anyway, uh, I've told you about what's on this slide, and uh, let me summarize uh, some work that's in a paper that I'll, I'll refer you to at the end, that any credible model of the undervote shows that it's extremely likely that actually Jennings should have won by thousands of votes. And there's a very interesting pattern of the undervote. Um, what do I mean by a credible model of the undervote? Um, let me tell you a little bit about how we do that. Um, so in general, you always just assume that missing votes are, are like the ones that you can see. But the model could be a very broad one, and if you assume that they're missing at random, you'll say, then the ones we're missing are like the ones seen, and that won't change anything. You know, if we lost 15,000 votes and they're just like the ones <laughs> that we've seen, then we still have the same ratio of Republicans and Democratic votes, there's, you know, that's what it is. If you say, well, half of them were in Sarasota, the, the lost votes were in Sarasota County, uh, what does that mean? Then you get a different estimate. I showed you that. There's actually some very cool stuff that you can do. It's really at a very basic level. It's something that can be shown to an introductory class of statistics. But basically, you take about half the, uh, half the, a substantial fraction of all the ballots cast in Sarasota County had votes for every single one of the five statewide races. The race for senator, governor, uh, for, uh, I think, um, attorney general, for chief financial officer, and for commissioner of agriculture. 
And so what you could do is you could find for all of the votes in which people voted that way on those five races, some of them, most of them, had a vote in the sixth place, had a vote for the congressional district, and some of them were missing. So you could say, we will ascribe the missing votes the same way that the visible votes were, were cast. So if, if there was a ballot that was cast that voted Republican on all five of those races, but there was a missing vote on the sixth race, let's look at all of those who voted Republican on those five races and had a visible vote on the sixth race. And about 96 out of 100 such votes went for Buchanan. So you say for those, we call, that's the way we assign those votes. And uh, if we go to the straight ticket, uh, Democratic ticket, we have the same kind of thing. And if you go through and you actually look at that data, it raises the, um, the apparent winning margin of Jennings to over 3,000. Okay, so, uh, you know, mistakes do happen. And I think most people who are running elections are, are honestly trying their best. But we have handed them a, a really hard row to hoe. Yes? Did, did anyone attempt to sample voters in Sarasota County and ask them? Um, I, su I suspect so. I'm not aware of that in particular. You know, once something I would love to see done regularly and I'd really like to see people be advocates for is contemporaneous po exit polling in which not we're not particularly interested in who you voted for, although you might ask that, but you ask questions like, um, do you feel confident that your vote uh, was recorded? Uh, how long did you wait? Did you have trouble with the machinery? Um, and it, the moment that there is the question that maybe the election has been m muddled by, uh, by problems, then the people who come forward, you can't quite trust that. So by the time you're out there polling, asking people, um, then their, their memories are, are affected by their sense of the importance of their answer to an outcome that they care about. So it's, it's a problem. Um, so anyway, um, what I would say is that the people who run elections uh, are usually honest and hardworking. Uh, there, are th there are places in which there are long histories of folks who are the political hacks who have used the sloppiness in the system to advantage their cause. And that is not something that is restricted to just Republicans. <laughs> I will tell you that, I that when we saw problems in Ohio in 2004, uh, I talked to people in Ohio, and the folks who run elections are very, very, uh, the ones who want to manipulate those elections are very knowledgeable about how to keep switching the polling places so people are confused about where to go. And I mean, there's just a lot of stuff we tolerate that we shouldn't tolerate uh, that makes it harder for people to cast their votes. Okay, so, um, so anyway, if you're, <laughs> if you're a partisan, um, you don't care, you don't necessarily want to fix the holes in the system. You're happy to have it be sloppy as long as you think that that sloppiness advantages you. And I don't want anybody to get away with that if, uh, if we can help it. Okay, and, uh, and I, do think, I do think that we should use language like vote theft. It's like you go to, the, to an ATM and you ask for $100 and your account is debited by $100 and you get handed four 20s. And you didn't count, so you just stuck it in your pocket and you thought you had your $100. But you only had four 20s. I think it's very analogous. These voters went to the polls. They thought they had the opportunity to have their vote counted in all of these races, but they only had four 20s. They didn't have their $100. And I think that's what happened, and I think it's a form of theft, and I, I think we should call it that. Um, Okay, so uh, now, I, now I, my um, narrative gets much less focused because I want to just cover a set of things which are a subset of all the things that are wrong with our elections that we need to be working on and to just give you some of the 
flavor and to point you to some places where there are articles uh, that uh, tell you about what people are doing with some of these problems. And uh, so, uh, you know, what did we have in CD13 in 2000? There were no paper ballots. But in fact, paper ballots per se wouldn't necessarily have fixed this problem. If you don't, if you don't cast a vote, uh, you know, a paper recount is not going to solve it. Although the people who study usability tell us that uh, if you had one big piece of paper, it is much less likely that you would miss a single election than if you have this kind of screen situation. So there's a lot of people know a lot of things about how to do a good job of making sure that uh, people's opinions are polled properly. And there certainly should be um, two kinds of data collected. If we're going to use uh, electronic machines to tally, fine, but we should also have paper records and we should compare them because the different sorts of systems make different mistakes. And uh, so we should be able to compare two things to say, do they give us the same answer? And, um, and in CD13, the only thing that could be done when this tiny, tiny difference, mar margin of victory, uh, called for a mandatory recount is just retabulate on the same machines. So you didn't really have an independent way of knowing if the outcome was correct. And uh, um, so uh, the other thing is to understand the difference between random errors, which always have in a large, complicated industrial process, and systematic errors. And, uh, and uh, so be, be on top of that. It's really different to say voters have an obligation to learn how to use the system uh, than to say, you know, we ran a race and there were two re relay teams and the folks in one relay team had a lot more barriers than the folks in the other relay team. And that's just not fair. Okay, um, so uh, we can't tell the difference between vote fraud and vote theft. Um, but I would say that it's wrong to call what happened in CD13 in 2006 voter error. I just really don't think it is voter error. Yes. No. Yes. Uh, so the question is about the other races where um, where there were big un big uh, undercounts, they were not necessarily uh, Republican versus Democratic. Uh, um, I mean, it didn't always disadvantage the uh, the, the Democrat. Um, it really does seem clear that it's an easy mistake for people to make, uh, or ha has been in the past. It wasn't systematic across the state. That much we know. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, so that question, uh, let me hold it for a moment. And essentially it's saying what other characteristics of voters might be associated with the undervote? And uh, it's a good question. Uh, but the election recently uh, in Iran um, caused me to think very carefully about the fact that there has come to be, I believe, a, uh, a worldwide perception that a good way to topple a regime is to just start saying that the election is, uh, is stolen <laughs> and to plan <laughs> publicity bl uh, blitz well in advance and to pretend to participate and to just come and say the election was stolen. And of course, since the actors on both sides are not fully honorable, uh, <laughs> when you're done, it's really hard to know what happened. And there was a lot of 
shenanigans on both sides. And I do worry about, about the, I, I'm not asking you to be skeptical of every outcome. <laughs> I'm, I'm not asking you to uh, jump to the conclusion that there's been fraud or that the electoral outcome is wrong just because there are errors. And just because some, it is, it is absolutely predictable that some people will be manipulating things uh, in all elections. So the, the goal of this line of research that I'm involved in and others are involved in and I ask you to pay attention to is to try to make elections less sloppy so that there's less room for either frivolous mudslinging to say the election was wrong or to say um, uh, we won when in fact maybe we didn't win. Okay, so um, I thought I actually had a slide to answer your question. Uh, a great deal is known about the fact that that uh, people's education level, their socioeconomic status, their race, their age, many, many factors make it more difficult for some people to jump over barriers than others. So someone like Sandra Day O'Connor, who has no sympathy with voters who can't figure out how to mark the ballot. She just has no sympathy with that. Um, I would say it's very important to understand that the, if we make it sufficiently easy, so that people with the greatest problems voting find it easy to vote, we will have less to worry about, and everybody will find it easier to vote. Um, so, so this sort of use it. There's usability studies. There's a lot of ways to make it to get rid of barriers, and our goal should be to get rid of whatever barriers we can. Yes. The ballot in the rest of the of CD13 just didn't have this problem of of two races on the same uh, uh, on the same page, and I'm not sure about the banners. Okay, so uh, a big push of the American Statistical Association is this push towards uh, developing statistically sound auditing laws, and the state of auditing in this country is terrible. There are virtually no um, uh, uh, very few states uh, do an audit that could give you much confidence. And I would say that there it's very important to understand that there are two very different reasons to do audits. And one of them is to feel confident that the winner won. Uh, but personally, I think it's more important to do audits to be sure that we are doing continuous quality improvement. The most important thing we can do is collect information on what goes wrong and figure out how to make things go wrong less often. So, um, so uh, the, the first thing that we need is data. A statistician would say that, right? We need timely, comprehensive public reporting of useful, standardized data. And that is one of the things that I know will come out of the vote, uh, out of the auditing conference this next weekend. But uh, we can't do anything with the sorts of trash that comes out of many of the machines that uh, states have purchased. And so we want to have laws that say any, anything that will be viewed as acceptable as a voting machine system in the future is going to have to produce this kind of good data that will enable us to figure out what the heck happened. Okay. Um, uh, there are some wonderful voter surveys that have been done. Um, there's a group at MIT that, uh, that during the time that the Supreme Court was speculating that it was a public interest to increase public confidence in, in how trustworthy our elections were and, uh, and that therefore it was legitimate to have uh, fairly onerous voter ID requirements. Um, there was actually some MIT researchers who were out there studying what happened during elections. And they found that there was essentially no correlation between the presence of a law requiring a voter ID and whether or not the voters were asked to show their ID. And furthermore, there was absolutely no correlation between voters' sense that the voting process was secure and whether or not there was a law or they had been asked for their ID. So instead of basing laws and judgments on speculation, we actually could br bring some data to bear. 
And uh, so I've talked about exit polling to talk about usability to really try to improve our process. And, uh, and understand that the voter is the best judge of their experience but does not necessarily know uh, whether or not the system is secure. So you can ask them whether they feel it's secure and it is important that voters feel th that they have a good system but it's also important that it be secure. <laughs> so anyway, there's a lot of other issues. Uh, felon disenfranchisement laws actually have been shown to substantially contribute to the disenfranchisement of non-felons. Um, uh, the voter ID laws, um, you know, it might not be such a bad idea to have voter ID laws, but uh, there's a question about grandfathering this in, and you know, it might solve some of our problems associated with, uh, with uh, your arriving at the polling place and they're having no sense of who you are. Uh, but these things have to be done carefully. It's very clear that there's certain classes of voters who don't have, um, don't have uh, driver's licenses uh, who are going to be disadvantaged in the short run uh, when they go to their polling place that they've been going to for the last 50 years and get told uh, you can't vote today because you don't have your driver's license. Anyway, and there's a lot of really nitty gritty stuff uh, when you meet with the clerks and you really try to think about how hard their lives are and how to make it easier so they can do a good job. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of improvement to be had. There, there are these wonderful teams. Uh, I sort of have a new job so I have to do something else with my life, but, but I am happy to say that uh, there's a lot of good people who are now working on these problems. And I'm really trying to figure out how to, how to get to the place where the courts will be able to distinguish between um, you know, crying foul when the, there is no foul and really um, uh, changing things when there is something that needs to be changed. Uh, so unfortunately this reads very poorly, but uh, the A American Statistical Association, the ASA, just coincidence, I'm ASA, but anyway, uh, it's uh, amstat.org outreach election auditing resources.cfm and I just couldn't get it to to print the way I wanted to. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. There's the article that I wrote with my friend John Lamperti um, about Florida uh, CD13. Uh, there's a lot of other interesting material on that page. And, and I'd like to bring your attention to another site um, from Mass Math Awareness Month 2008. April is always Math Awareness Month. And in 2008, it was dedicated to voting. And so under MAM08 essays, there are a lot of interesting articles about trying to fix a gerrymandering problem. Lots and lots of interesting stuff, really good stuff. There you be.